important. Kevin Trenberth is going to tell us about how reanalyses are getting better and are useful for diagnosing feedbacks. Um, a case of study of radiation versus temperature. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so I decided, uh, since this is, has a Shukla theme, that we should certainly talk about reanalyses. Uh, Johania and Lennart have already talked about it a bit, and I'm in the interest of time, I'm going to skip through some of the some of the slides fairly quickly. So, uh, one of the things which which has happened is uh, is that reanalyses have proliferated, uh, and uh, there are many groups now doing this, and they are certainly getting a lot better. Uh, the origins uh, of this, of reanalysis, I will suggest, actually came out of the US TOGA panel and the interactions of a number of us there. And I think, uh, you know, I was doing a lot of work with the N NMC and, uh, analyses and, and frustrated with all of the changes, spurious changes over time. And I think Shukla was the key person who actually thought we could do something about it. And so this was the time when uh, he actually had black hair. Uh, um, this is the, this is the uh, let's see if there's a pointer here. There is. Yeah, so these are the first two papers that really talked about reanalysis. And, and our one uh, that uh, was really dealing much more with the, the need and documenting why we needed a reanalysis uh, came out actually a month ahead of the paper by Lennart and, uh, and Shukla. Uh, and as you've, you've heard, uh, Shukla passed on uh, this to uh, Johania, which uh, got the NSEP uh, reanalysis underway. And so the, the first, uh, first generation of reanalyses are listed here. And this is just a quick summary. I'm not going to uh, delve into this in any detail except to make the point in the last bullet that these reanalyses have become quite useful now for looking at a number of aspects of the interannual variability in the long-term trends. Unfortunately, I will say there are far too many papers in the literature that have confused the real variability in the world with spurious variability because of changes in the observing system. So this is just a listing of the current set of reanalyses that people are using, and I'm not going to spend any more time on that. So the framework of what I want to talk about here is to use the reanalyses to look at the temperature fields in particular. And this is the framework dealing with feedbacks. And so lambda in this equation is the feedback parameter. And it's very much related to the climate sensitivity, uh, given the uh, forcings associated with a doubling of carbon dioxide, the term F. Then, uh, and given lambda, then we can determine the climate sensitivity, uh, the, the change in temperature, which is F over lambda. And these are some uh, results uh, here uh, down below. And so firstly, for, uh, for a, uh, an Earth with no feedbacks, the estimate is that lambda would be 3.2 watts per square meter for a degree change in temperature. And these are some empirical estimates using surface temperatures with uh, one sigma uh, error bars um, from a, a series of different analyses. There was one a notorious one by Linton and Troy, which used only the tropics. And when we redid their analysis correctly, this is actually the correct number. And one of the key things here is that if these numbers are less than this uh, black body number for the, for the Earth without feedbacks, then this implies that there are positive feedbacks in the climate system. So this is uh, what we're going to look at now. Uh, and that means we need to look at the radiation at the top of the atmosphere and uh, also the temperature fields and see how they relate to one another given, this, given the best data that we have at the moment. So in this slide, I'm showing actually the ECMWF uh, top of the atmosphere fluctuations along with the series values. There's some serious biases on the right-hand side here in the mean annual cycle of the, uh, the reanalysis because there's no, uh, there's no uh, adjustments as occurs in climate models to balance the top of the atmosphere radiation. And many of the reanalyses are really quite poor. The NSEP reanalysis is more than 10 watts per square meter out of balance, for instance. Uh, ECMWF turns out to be the, the better one, the RA interim. 
Um, but there are some serious problems in the absorbed solar radiation and the outgoing long wave radiation, uh, although the net radiation here does compare quite well with the series values. And I think this also provides some uh, encouragement with regard to the series values for these high frequency fluctuations, which are perhaps surprisingly large. Uh, the, you know, the standard deviation of these is about 0.65 watts per square meter, so you can see the fluctuations can easily be plus or minus one watt per square meter for a monthly mean. And you know, for climate change, we're looking for numbers between 0.5 and one watt per square meter for the energy imbalance. Down below, I've got the clear sky version, and here I would actually suggest that the ECMWF values may be better than the series values, because there are some spurious changes in the series values associated with how they remove clouds. Uh, in particular in 2008, and many people in the community are not aware of the fact of that fact. And so a lot of the stuff you see on cloud radiative effects and cloud forcing uh, have not factored that into, a, into their analyses. Um, I think, uh, who was it, Leonard uh, suggested that uh, the temperature, uh, temperatures in, in reanalyses are actually very good. In fact, I think they're better than any of these other ones here because the others all have missing data. There is this one exception that uh, in about 2000, there was a change in the source of the sea surface temperature fields that went into driving the ECMWF reanalyses. And, and so there is a, a, a reduced uh, change over the oceans of uh, uh, maybe as much as 0.1 degrees Celsius uh, that uh, knocks down the trends uh, slightly in ERA interim relative to the others, but in general, ERA interim has much better coverage in places like the Arctic where there are big changes. But what we're going to look at here is the three-dimensional structure. Adrian Simmons has done a, a careful validation of this, and this is what, uh, if you average over land, the ocean, and the tropics, the actual time series look like uh, from 1979 through, to 2000, through 2013. Uh, you can see the big uh, Pinatubo, uh, uh, Pin El Chichon and Pinatubo eruption effects, which penetrate down to 200 millibars, actually, uh, in, in the tropics. And you can see the coherence of the structures that generally occur, um, certainly up through about 200 to 150 millibars or thereabouts. Um, this is the structure as a function of latitude of the vertically averaged temperature now, and you can see Whoops, uh, you can see here the, the major El Nino events and more or less a, a lot more noise at, at higher latitudes. So now I'm looking at the global mean and, uh, and uh, this is the time series relative to the overall means uh, as a function of um, uh, the pressure levels. And then down below what I'm giving you are a number of time series. So the black curve down below here is, is perhaps one of the key ones. This is what we call the uh, tropospheric average, which we've defined to be the, the surface to 150 uh, hectopascals. And uh, we're going to use that uh, uh, a lot more, along with the, the two meter temperature, which is the red curve here. The sea surface temperature is also given here. And I've also put down the, the so-called uh, Nino 3.4, or ONI sea surface temperature down below here. And I've also added the um, vertically integrated water vapor. This is the uh, global average of the total column water vapor here. Uh, with water vapor, there are some spurious changes over time associated with changes in SSMI, and there was a big one right here. So that, uh, let's see if this works. Uh, it probably looks more like this in reality. Uh, for those of you who missed it, uh, go back, there is, that's what the actual values look like, but I think the correct values are somewhat lower down here, so there is an upward trend that follows the temperatures, and so this 0.66 correlation with the tropospheric temperature is an underestimate. Uh, the correlations with two meter temperature between the troposphere and, and, and the two meter temperatures, 0.81, and some other values are given here down below. Uh, there is a slight lead of the uh, Nino 3.4 uh, over the overall tropospheric temperatures um, by uh, uh, a month or two, and, uh, and that's, that's, what, that's what it looks like. So if you do an EOF analysis of the full three-dimensional structure of temperature, 
This is the predominant uh, EOF that comes out. It's coherent throughout the troposphere, uh, mainly from about 40 north to 40 south, and then there's the opposite sign in the, in the lower stratosphere, and that accounts for 25% of the total three-dimensional variance. And this is what it looks like if you take the two-meter temperature, the global average two-meter temperature, which is used so often in climate sensitivity analyses, and then do the correlation locally to see what is contributing to this global mean. So maybe you can see some sort of El Nino effects in here and also some, some general warming, but uh, uh, the number at the top is the global mean of the correlation, which is 0.162 in this case. Then if you look at the, the tropospheric temperature and do the, do the global mean versus the local values, you can see it's dominated by uh, this, uh, the tropics, uh, the warming of the entire tropics uh, associated especially with El Ninos. And, and there, the global mean correlation is 0.35. So uh, here's now looking at the uh, radiation at the top of the atmosphere, the, the second curve here, the black curve, the net radiation. Uh, it's given by the absorbed solar radiation minus the outgoing long wave radiation, and those two components are plotted in the top uh, time series here. You can see there's a tremendous amount of variability from month to month. Um, they tend to be slightly positively correlated, but when you put them together, this is what you get down below, and you can see these large low-frequency fluctuations which are associated with things like El Nino events, along with a lot of high-frequency fluctuations, and then I've got the tropospheric temperature down below. So you can see the negative correlation here, which is minus 0.57, is quite strong, but you can also see readily that the high-frequency fluctuations from month to month are much more pronounced. In the, long way, in, in the radiation curves than they are in the temperature curves, which also tells you that this is not the cause of these fluctuations. And in fact, what is the cause is, is weather. It's, it's very much associated with clouds, primarily, more than anything else. And that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit more now. So uh, a lot has been done on the global mean values, but what happens if you then zero in and um, in the paper we've written, we, we look at land and we look at oceans, we look at the tropics. Uh, here I'm looking at things locally to see what the relationship is between the local uh, two meter temperature at, at the top and the tropospheric temperature in the lower panels here uh, with the total column water vapor. I don't know if you've seen patterns like this before. On the right, I've got the regression. And so the regression tells you a bit more which areas are contributing to the global mean. And also, let's see if this works, yes. Um, and so there's two numbers on the bottom right of each panel here. The first one is the global mean of the correlation, and the, the value down below is the correlation between the global means. The correlation between the global means is the thing that enters into these climate sensitivity calculations, and to the extent that these differ from one another, it tells you something a little bit about some of the local processes and the way they cancel. These patterns are quite interesting in their own rights, and you can see the general positive correlation. So Clausius Clapeyron works higher temperatures, uh, there's more water vapor in the atmosphere, except right in the, in the tropics. If, if you look firstly at the tropospheric temperatures, you can see the ITCZ and the, and the South Pacific Convergence Zone and so on, and you can see that these negative regions are in the regions of the subsidence. And so this is where the air has come up into the atmosphere, it's subsiding, it's been desiccated, raining all of the moisture out in the upward branches, and it's, it's dry, but it's warming through subsidence. And so you've got dry going along with high temperatures, and that's responsible for these negative correlations in the subtropics. And uh, by the way, these, these are very useful diagnostics for evaluating models, and this pattern here is not well replicated in most climate models. Let me just say that. And the, the top panel is not quite the same with the two meter temperature. And there, this is a much stronger role for precipitation. So if you note where these, where these negative values occur in, in the tropics, uh, and then uh, uh, this is the correlation between the two meter temperature and the precipitation. This is the uh, observations. This is the ERA interim two meter temperature along with GPCP, monthly mean anomalies. Uh, so you can see these negative regions over uh, land in general, 
Uh, that sort of the idea that when it's hot, it's dry, uh, if, you, if you want to put that into words. Over the ocean, much of the ocean, certainly in the extratropics, it tends to be positive, and it's positive, of course, in the El Nino region. And so high sea surface temperatures produce convergence and upward motion, lots of uh, moisture and, and precipitation. Uh, over in the Western Pacific, though, the precipitation is not determined locally by the sea surface temperatures. It's much more associated with things like the walker circulation, the downward branch, and remote effects. And the, and the blue areas over the ocean in the Western Pacific are also areas that are not reproduced well in climate models. So I won't have time to go into that. Five minutes, all right. So uh, here's what it looks like just looking at the correlations with the absorbed solar radiation on the left and the outgoing long wave radiation on the like. On the right, the top is two meter temperature. The second one is the tropospheric temperature. And the bottom is water vapor. And so you see, you, you can see these negative relationships uh, with, with water vapor throughout most of the tropics uh, and extending into the extratropics, but positive values at high latitudes. Uh, those, um, but as we've seen, water vapor is, strength, is very strongly correlated with temperature, and so we're not actually fully seeing the, the, the relationships here, um, and one needs to do uh, partial re uh, correlations or uh, screening regressions to take out the common variability of temperature in order to see what water vapor really looks like. It's also interesting here to see the striking correspondence between the absorbed solar radiation and the outgoing long wave radiation uh, with, the, with the temperatures and the differences between the two meter temperature and the tropospheric temperature. So the absorbed solar radiation is very much related to clouds which are blocking the sun and, and over land it heats the, heats the land. Uh, notice where the outgoing long wave radiation is coming from and it's primarily from land. Uh, so the main window to space is over land which doesn't have as much water vapor. Uh, I don't have time to go into that in, in as much detail as is perhaps warranted. Uh, here's, we're now looking at uh, the correlations on the left and the regressions on the right with, uh, with these uh, temperatures and the water vapor uh, on, the, um, on, the, on the net radiation, which is the combination of the two previous slides. And I don't know from the two previous slides whether you could guess that it would actually come out this way. And again, here, this, the, the contrast between the two meter temperature versus the tropospheric temperature is quite striking. And now we're also seeing that there are some significant differences, uh, for instance, here, between the global mean of the correlations, which is positive, versus the correlation between the global means, which is quite significantly negative. And this is, these differences are, are quite significant uh, throughout here. And uh, I don't have time to go into all of the details related to this. I want to get to what happens then when we come back to the, to the global means and we look at it in this, in this framework of trying to estimate values of lambda. And so if you estimate lambda without dealing with the forcings at the moment, the correlation is minus 0.57 and it corresponds to a regression of minus 2.2 .2 watts per square meter for a one degree change in temperature, whereas if you look at the surface, the correlation is much worse. You're not accounting for anything like as much variance, and this is what you get out of the regression, and it's of marginal significance. One of the things we can do, though, is to remove the, uh, or look at the water vapor separately, and we can put a water vapor term into this. These are in different units, so be a bit, bit careful here. But uh, it turns out if you screen the water vapor or the, or the radiation for the temperature effects, then there is a positive correlation with water vapor and the net radiation absorbed, the energy imbalance, and, uh, and it corresponds to this value here from the regression that we get. And so you end up with this down the bottom here, and it says that if there was no water vapor component, that you've actually got 2.89 watts per square meter radiating to space for a change in temperature of this tropospheric temperature versus 3.2 for uh, without an atmosphere. And these are getting quite close, which says there's not much room for other effects. There's a little bit maybe for, uh, for um, ice albedo effects, uh, positive feedbacks, and, and maybe for, for clouds, but it's not very, very great. 
And so there, there certainly is positive feedbacks, but here, of course, we've now incorporated a lot of the greenhouse effects uh, throughout the troposphere, and it, it's not surprising that we're a lot closer to the, to the black blotty uh, value. Um, you can do this kind of analysis with models, and I think there's potential for narrowing our understanding of feedbacks and uh, climate sensitivity if you do that carefully, but you do need good long, reliable data sets to do that, and it's a little bit of a struggle. So uh, these are the concluding re remarks here, and uh, I just want to close by saying that I've served with uh, Shukla on many panels, the TOGA panels, uh, the, the JSC, uh, and there's a couple of uh, uh, pictures here uh, with, with Shukla and me at, at a JSC meeting in 2006, and uh, an earlier meeting, I think that was a WMP meeting, uh, Shukla, uh, when we were in Geneva, walking along Lake Geneva. So um, uh, I've certainly enjoyed interacting with Shukla and, and uh, talking about uh, these issues that are very much in, in common. Thanks. One of the uh, interesting things from the series data is to find on an annual basis that the albedo of the two hemispheres is, is very, very close, and the outgoing longer radiation of the two hemispheres is very, very close. This has, I think, great implications for paleoclimate, but also it says something about the, the validity of models. Um, for example, uh, when you look through all the uh, MIT-5 models, uh, they are out of sync between the two hemispheres up to plus or minus five watts per square meter, uh, as distinct from series, which is about 0.2 watts per square meter. Uh, how well does the, the, the reanalysis data measure up relative to the same type of thing, the same synchronicity? Well, as I sort of hinted at earlier, you cannot use the reanalyses to look at top of the atmosphere radiation in a reliable fashion. And, and when you look at absorbed solar radiation and outgoing long wave radiation, you quickly lose confidence and it, it tells you that the clouds do not have the right optical thickness and, and the, the, right, the right properties. And so you can't do that. On the other hand, uh, when we're looking at temperatures, you know, we're assimilating a tremendous amount of data which uh, is um, directly influencing the, the temperature fields, the radiance fields, and so on. And there's a, a lot more reliability in those now. But no, you can't, you, we can't really use the top of the atmosphere radiation from the reanalysis for many of them at this point. This is one of the things that I think, through, partly through our work and, and, and uh, things like this, that the reanalyses people are more aware of, and they, I think they can certainly do better, but it's still not something that they can tune in the same way that climate modelers do. You know, the climate models tune the energy imbalance by twiddling the clouds, typically, or cloud parameters, typically, but because of the very large fluctuations from one month to the next of order of watt per square meter, it's very hard to do that using, using observational data. Uh, Kevin, I was just wondering what your feeling is about the quality of reanalysis and so on, to, to be able to say anything about this apparent uh, discrepancy between the warming trends that the climate models get in the upper tropical troposphere with climate change and the observations. Is that still, are the error bars still too big to say anything useful or, or not? So. I actually showed you the time series of the vertical profiles, and, and you can see that there was this big jump somewhere around 97, 98, and, and uh, it's been much warmer throughout the 2000s. This is the so-called hiatus, and, uh, and it's essentially throughout the troposphere. There's not as much, uh, there's not really quite the, the maximum uh, in the upper troposphere to the extent that some of the models tend, tend to show, but uh, I think that Issue, you know, I think that issue has gone down partly as we've gotten better data uh, from um, from these reanalyses and, uh, and and the radio sounds have been improved. So it, it's not as bad as was depicted earlier. At least uh, the data are are showing 
Uh, but yeah, there's, it's, it's still not quite as large as, I mean, this, this relates a lot to, to convective, convection and convective parameterization. I think that's still an issue in the models. So I was you know, interested in your methodology for getting uh, sensitivity, and I, I'm not sure if you're using that as a diagnostic tool or as a way to actually estimate the sensitivity, but there's you know, tremendous danger in doing what you're doing because many times the sea surface temperature is warm because the radiation budget has been altered by large-scale dynamics, and if you use the logic that you're using there, you can infer that the climate is unstable or something like that if you're not careful. And there's also the issue of storage in the system, even when you're looking at annual means. You and I are completely in step okay, on that. Good. I mean, the, the final conclusion, the final statement of our, of our paper, which is in press in JGR, by the way, um, uh, is to say that all of these studies that have used the so-called observational record to make a, a statement about climate sensitivity are out to lunch. I mean, for heaven's sakes, the record is too short and it's entirely dominated by these, these fluctuations which are mostly associated with the internal variability of the climate system, the clouds in particular. I mean, this is what you get when you start looking at these things more regionally or locally. And, uh, and uh, the, also during this period, the, the forcing is quite small. The, the dominant forcing is the, is the increases in greenhouse gases, which is a water 0.3 watts per square meter per decade or something of that order. But uh, the volcanic signal is, is tiny. I mean, you could see in the, in the, in the temperature time series that the uh, volcanic signal earlier was, was uh, quite strong in the temperature record, but we don't have that for the series period. Uh, and I don't think we can do that for, for Irby uh, reliably either. One of the things I will say is that I think some of the results relating to the upper tropospheric uh, warming um, are contaminated by the El Chichon and the Pinatubo signals, and, and, uh, and you need to be sought out the, actually the volcanic signal to properly make reliable statements about that. And, and so the work that people like Ben Santer have done and so on uh, have really not done that properly. And so this, uh, certainly in the NCAR model, the, client, the, the volcanic signal is strong down to 100 millibars or thereabouts, but it doesn't go down to 200 millibars. And in the real world, it sure looks like there's a signal that penetrates down to 200 millibars. And so you can say then that the models don't necessarily do the volcanic signal right, but the perceptions then about the changes over time in terms of the upper troposphere are affected by how you actually treat the volcanic signal. So um, yeah, this. Uh, there's a lot of, I think Dennis's message is that there's a lot of traps for the unwary here. <laughs> and, and making statements about climate sensitivity is not something we can do out of this. But we may be able to make some statements about feedbacks. Thank, thank you again. Oh, sorry. Uh, last question. Yes, Kristen. I mean, we have recently used the uh, uh, deep troposphere temperature as a more robust uh, parameter than to use the uh, surface or two meter temperature. And you see that we've done that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. And that would see, seem to me much more sensible in estimating climate sensitivity to use such a metric because uh, 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 due to external forcing, of course, the greenhouse gases, and of course you have a, such a rapid adjustment in the troposphere anyhow, so it's better to use something which is more robust. I think there's a lot more that can be done on that. Yeah. Yes, I agree with you. Okay, thank you, thank you.